Hello, friends. This is Carter, and welcome to this episode of Making It Up, the conversation series between writers. Um, quick announcement just uh, before I get into today's episode, just to let you all know, um, I, you know I, I've done uh, uh, coaching and mentoring uh, before. Um, as you probably know, I, I'm, I've run a writing retreat, which I'm going to repeat a couple times in 2024. Um, but I, you know, I'm trying to make it a little bit more publicly known that I, I do offer coaching. I do offer mentoring, um, one-on-one, uh, can be anything from developmental editing to just talking to somebody about the industry. If you're trying to break into, into, um, into the publishing industry from a writer's perspective. Um, so if that's something that you might want to pursue, I offer complimentary initial phone calls where we can just discuss and see if uh, we're a good match and it, and if coaching is something that might work for you. Um, you can just reach out to me at me at carterwilson.com and, um, and, and I'm happy to have that conversation. So that being said, let's dive in today's episode. So um, I'm always excited when I get to talk to thriller writers um, just because it's my bag. Um, and, and, and obviously, you know, thriller writing uh, is an umbrella that covers a lot of territory. Um, but I feel like there's this community um that i've grown close to that writes uh, domestic suspense domestic thrillers um, kind of those stories about you know the world's not going to end in the story it's not a not a, a huge global thriller and not an espionage or, or financial crimes thriller um but but th- just the the malevolence that happens behind closed suburban front doors um that's the kind of stuff I write. That's the kind of stuff a lot of my friends write. And so I, I got to talk to a debut author who falls into this category. Um, so I was very excited today to talk to Elise Hart Kipnis, whose um, who's debut novel, Lights Out, is coming out November 1st, 2023. So, and she she spent her career as a, as a, as a, as a reporter, political reporter, uh, and a reporter on non-political things, but usually horrible, awful, sad, uh, grief-ridden things, and then made her way into sports journalism and sports reporting, uh, where she found a, a, a very warm home there. Uh, and that kind of led her to think about writing uh, her first novel, which is ha- ha- has, has a landscape of sports behind it, but isn't necessarily a sports story. Um, and she was, um, she, she's got an interesting tale about, you know, the trials and tribulations of finding an agent. Um, I think she said she had something like 168, uh, rejections, which is not uncommon by the way. Uh, and then before she finally landed her agent and then her agent sold her book within a month. So, um, all things ended up well for her, but, um, she's just, she's just starting out. She's got obviously a Seems to be a huge career in front of her. It's very exciting. Uh, we had a lot in common. We had a lot of friends in common. So it was nice to kind of talk shop with her. I think you're going to like this one. This is uh, my lovely conversation with Elise Hart Kipnis. Welcome. Nice to meet you. Uh, nice. Exciting times for you. I, I, I assume you're a, a couple weeks out from your launch, right? Yeah, and I'm on Amazon first read, so yeah, it's right, kind of crazy. Um, yeah, I yeah. figured you were published by Amazon when I went to your page, and I'm like, oh, she's got a couple thousand reviews, and it hasn't come out yet. Oh, that's 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 Amazon. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> sure enough, Thomas yeah. and Mercer. Yeah, Thomas and Mercer. Yep, absolutely. It was. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's been crazy. It's been crazy. So where where do you live? Where are you right now? I live in Stamford, Connecticut. Okay. Uh, and we're switching. We're splitting our time these days. We're also in um, Key West for the winter now. Oh, oh, yeah. a very uh, snowbird of you. I know. <laughs> we have the college kids, so yeah, yeah, uh, we do not like the winter anymore. Yeah, I I am just recently an empty nester as well. Oh, really? Uh, really? So, yeah, so I'm still getting. I just as of this August, my daughter is a junior at MSU at Michigan State, and my son just went off to uh, LSU, and I'm I'm here in Colorado, so they are far away. Yeah, yeah. 
That's how are you doing with that? Good. I'm doing, I mean, you know, it's weird. Uh, yeah. But, but I mean, I remember when I was called, I don't actually have memories of calling home, like, you know, way back when. And I'm sure I did, uh, but I don't remember. But I talk to my kids, especially my daughter, daily. Um, yeah. and, and my son, uh, <laughs> I have to call him. Uh, but so probably every other day, every three days or something like that. So, um, but is that I just went last week to go visit him at the campus. So that oh, was, that, that, that was good for me. I was just having a conversation about, um, just, you mentioned you're in Connecticut, um, with Hank, uh, Philippi Ryan yesterday, um, cause we're working on something together, not a book, but something else. And, and I was just saying, you know, I feel like if you're in the Northeast, if you're in that corridor pocket, uh, where you're within a reasonable distance of New York. Uh, there's so many, like I look at Instagram, I'm like, you know, Wendy Walker and Hank and all these people mm -hmm. are always doing events because there's such a concentration of, of, of literary events there that I'm like, I feel like, I feel like I'm missing out a little bit being here in Colorado because I'm constantly, every night they're doing something else. I know. I know. Wendy actually lives in the same town as me. Oh, fantastic. Yeah, yeah, and she um, she's doing an event with me the first week of my. Uh, yep, that's my, great. Uh, yeah, and I'll see her next month in Iceland, of all places. I am so desperate to go there next year. I, I have to figure out how to get invited. <laughs> well, so what I did just you know, yeah. um, I I saw you know it's same thing. I saw Wendy's pictures. And I'm like, fucking Iceland. That looks amazing. Right. So I, I just reached out to the organizers and, and, and they put they, they they put me in. Um so I mean it's not the kind of thing I would do every year, but it's it's uh, uh the Northern Lights are a, a bucket list thing for uh, my partner and me. So uh yeah, yeah. We're, you know, we're excited. We're excited to go. Um yeah. So are you from the Northeast? I am. I'm a Long Island girl. And... Oh, where in Long Island? That's where where, where my partner's from. Right, Ned? Oh, she's oh, it's Great Neck's further out, right? Am I, or am I? No, no. Great Neck is like the first part of Nassau County, which ah, is okay, okay. So yeah. you're a back Where's city. From? Uh, Northport, uh, East Northport. I lived in Northport for a year when I was working at uh, uh at uh News Twelve Long Island. Oh, uh, okay. Really uh, nice. It's yeah, really nice. Yeah, there. yeah. Born and raised there. Um, and so, and then you grew up, brothers, sisters. No, just me. <laughs> okay, I, I'm always I always like to ask about kind of the inceptions of, of of creativity, and it's always interesting to me because everyone's got different stories, but there's always usually a similar thread, and and there's definitely a thread of only children, um, in terms of like, yeah, books for my friends, or I was always at the library because I didn't have brothers, you know, that kind of a thing. Um, I don't know if that was the case for were you a reader growing up? In, have we started by the way? Oh yeah. Okay. <laughs> we have got all these technical snafus on camera recorded. <laughs> great, great. Edited. My, pro my producer will take care of all that stuff. Okay. Um, so I wasn't necessarily a, a only child by choice, which I may be really oversharing on my mom's part. <laughs> but I think my parents had wanted to have um, more kids. And I think that that sort of shaped how I grew up as an only child because they always had people around and encouraged me to bring mm. to things. So I, I would say I read a lot, but it wasn't like those kind of like books for my friends. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That kind of thing. Like my best friend is still my friend from when I was um, yeah, 16 and she mm. was in Stanford and she's like my sister. So I have, I have a lot of large extended family. Yeah. So I don't consider myself like a typical only child. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah, yeah. And I know you don't didn't go the creative writing route uh, initially through education, but right. you know, as you were growing up and as you started to think about maybe what you wanted to study in, in higher education, um, or what, what were your inclinations? I always wanted to be a reporter. So I read- Why is that, do you think? Like, where did I that come from? book um on edward or murrow in mm -hmm. elementary school and i was like i want to go into reporting and i mean that's the pinnacle right world. right and then i kind of came into reporting at a time when like 24-hour news was just coming on and it was like 
kind of more gross and you need a shower after every story you covered. And it wasn't like saving the world. It was more, I got covered Monica Lewinsky's grand jury hearings in Washington the month. And it was more like, how many showers do I have to take before? Right. You know, like somewhat plans. Right. Uh-huh. The reality of literally trying to fill up 24 hours as opposed to filling up three hours is a, is an abrupt yeah. shift. It's it, I, it's such an abrupt shift. And I think it, it really, in my opinion, has been terrible for the news industry in general. When I worked at WNBC in New York, we had morning newscasts. We had a noon newscast. We had a 5 o'clock and a 6.30. But even so, and that's a pretty like big wheel to be running on, um, I still had my scripts checked by producers. You know, they still went through the rigor of of checking everything. And once 24-hour news hit, that was gone. You know, right. there was no time. and No quality and control. No quality control. And there was no... There was no consideration to news. It was, let's predict what they say in that press conference. Here's the press conference, which really should be the news and then the fact checking on. And then, oh, it wasn't what we expected. It was literally I was covering sports years before I covered sports because they treated it like a sporting event. Ah, that's so interesting. Yeah, it was just. It was really disappointing. I was not Edward Armour. <laughs> so were you then a journalism major in school? I went to Brown and and they, I was a poli-sci major. Poli-sci, and okay. There was a radio station there, WBRU, which is a commercial radio station. And they sent us to the Iowa caucuses and the New Hampshire primaries. And um, I covered Von Bulow there. It was, it was amazing. So while I wasn't officially a journalism major. I was a journalism yeah. major in and that. Communications, yeah. That was my life. I worked yeah. at the radio station nonstop. And um, yeah, Brown, that radio station was amazing. It led to my first job at $6 an hour, uh, covering school boards at part-time at night at like a radio station this big that was mm-hmm. late. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. For the four yeah. people who wanted to hear about the school boards who right, didn't actually right. attend the meeting. Yeah, exactly. Those four people. Yeah. Four. <laughs> but you're 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 honing your skills and there is something right about I mean, it's such a it, regardless of what you're covering, that skill set is so highly useful to all aspects of life to be able to, uh, you know, succinctly summarize and communicate and emote. Uh, I'm, that's that's invaluable, I assume. Yeah, it's so interesting because you asked me like if I thought about writing as an author, as, you know, fiction um, when I was young. And I wasn't conscious of it, but I went back and found these diaries from, I don't know, 20 years ago, 30 years ago. And in it, I wrote, I wish I had more free time to write. Oh, interesting. I think I always loved writing, and and I wrote my own um, news stories, as you said, and and you really do learn that every single word matters because you have like a minute and a half of a story, and that includes the sound from the person you interviewed, and so you're right. really, really honing your skills. And one part that I think I really um, took to my writing that I'm conscious of taking is I would always look for a very small detail in my reporting that could express a big story, a big picture, a scene center. And I look for a tiny detail, not an overarching detail that could set that tone. And I I think I brought that into my writing, like yeah. find one little thing that brings you there. Right. Well, that's and that's interesting because that's such a journalistic trait. Like you'll read an article, you know, maybe and and maybe it's longer form. Um, but you know, nine times out of 10, it's going to start with the very personal, you know, small detail. And sometimes it's not done well. Sometimes I have no patience for it. Sometimes I'm like, I'll skip to the third paragraph where it's going to tell me what happened because that's why I'm reading the article. I don't need the big right. setup. Um, but when it's done well, it is, it's poignant and it, and it, but it does have to, you know, propel what you're about to read. So, yeah, so you're honing those skills and you're learning how to tell a story 
because I mean that sounds so basic, obviously, but it's 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 a skill most people don't have. When you know somebody will be writing like business journalism, and and they think, well, there's not it's not really a story. Well, like, yeah, it is a story, and it is your job to make it relatable to all of us. Um, and and a lot of people don't know how to do that. So I, I imagine you really um, you know hone your skills doing doing your reporting. Yeah, yeah, it was it was great, and I learned from so many amazing people. I remember um, when I worked at at News Twelve Long Island, I was um, the news director there. Would really focus on writing and go through all of that, and you know, redline the stories. And um, same at, at NBC. A and when I was young, I did internships at WCBS Radio, and and there was so much focus back then on the writing. And I did. I learned a tremendous amount. Um, there's some great writing books like the AP Broadcasters um, book on, on writing and just a bunch. And and it's all transferable to uh, this type of writing. You know, yeah. You're to never write, never write um, passive. It, it's so interesting, though, because um, you always write in the first in the present tense when you're a reporter. Right. A broadcast reporter. It's not this happened yesterday. It's 10 hours after this, they're doing this, you know, it's so it never occurred to me like the one thing if you said, well, you need to change your book and write in the past tense. I think that's the one thing that while I listened to so much advice and I took it seriously, I don't know that I could have done that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and that changes that like, your voice as a writer changes over time. So I've been doing this 20 years and I was always third person past tense because when I would read a book more often than not, I was third person past tense and my voice. And then I finally decided with my third book to do first person present. And I'm like, holy shit, this is like amazing. It's And I, and I found that I had much more skill doing that than third person past. And all of a sudden I realized like, because I, and I think if you are a person of empathy, um, especially of maybe perhaps profound empathy, writing first person present is the way to go because you are able to embody that character and you are able to see through their eyes. Um, and I find much more joy. In fact, the book that's coming out next year, I actually, we had big editorial issues with it. Um, <laughs> and I ended up changing it from third person past to first person present after wow. it was done because we weren't connecting with that character enough. And I was, a, it's a 21 year old female savant. So I was scared to try to do first person present with her. Um, right. And, but once I changed it, which took four months, it, it, it came alive. So, so, so that's, that's your, that's how you connect is, is going through first person present with your carry. So one point of view or multiple points of view. Well, the first book that's um, uh, lights out is uh, one point of view. Yeah. And, the second Makes book sense. coming out. And then, you know, that's like your baby steps, right? Like you don't try to do anything else. The second book, which is in the series, is Dangerous Play. I decided to dip my toe into something else. So it's still the same point of view, but I have flashbacks. Yeah. And I was so excited to like try something different. So that is in the past tense. It's still first person. Right. I don't know. As I go on, maybe I'll one day dip my toe into two points of view, but... Yeah. yeah, and I think it's best to keep it limited. Um, I, you know, once you have like, I mean, it depends on what you're writing, but if you're writing thrillers, I think having one point of view is optimal. Having a secondary point of view is fine. And sometimes I'll do a secondary point of view in third person past, just mm -hmm. so you can see we're not as close to this person. They have a smaller voice. We don't see them as much and, and we're a little bit more removed from them. Um, and it's also easier to keep the voices kind of more distinct by by doing that um yeah. so but it's it is fun to experiment and try and get feedback on it because you when you're starting out like i i don't know <laughs> this <Yeah. might> suck <laughs> did you did you find yourself thinking as that when when you were writing you were thinking of, uh, as that 21 year old but did you find yourself when you were away from the book thinking like her too I tend not to. And and w one of the things that happened to me was I was getting so much feedback from people I knew in my early books of like, oh, this sounds just like you. Like, yeah. oh, I totally see you. And I, that really annoyed me. I didn't want it to sound like me. 
So with that, not only did I do that first person present tense, I, I wrote from a female perspective. And all of that, I realized that like, I really enjoy this so much more, um, just exploring um, this side of things. So I tend to write from people who I, I would have no relationship to or have no knowledge of their thought process. So that when I'm not writing, I'm a little bit removed from it. What about you? I think my main character was me initially. And then as I wrote and wrote and wrote, it was like, do you remember those old, I mean, back then it was more like a girl thing, but um, there were those toys where where there was like a, um, a sticky person and you pull it off, it was magnet, and then you dress it and it would become- I know what you're talking like, about. Like, mm-hmm. I can't remember. And I keep trying to Google that. I can't even <laughs> down. Well, it's like- Right. So old. But I feel like Kate was that person, you know, pulled from me and then she became her own person. And like, she's way cooler than me, you know, former soccer gold medalist. I'm a soccer mom, you know, she right. like chases uh, bad guys. But but I do hear her inside me and she has certain, certain of my traits. So unlike what you said, I kind of am like, when my friends are like, oh, that's you, you know, the coffee obsession, uh, that is me. But, you know, she's really not me, like, but there are little elements. And, and I found that fun. Now, as I go on in my career, um, I might change that up. Yeah, it, well, it's, it's weird because I have some strange aversion to writing about things I know. And I don't know why that is. And I think it is because I don't want to be predictable and I don't want people to be like, like you said, like if I have a coffee obsession in the book, they'll be like, oh, that's so you. I'm like, oh, but it's a lot of people. But I'm annoyed now that you said this about me. So <laughs> I will, I will create a character as minor as it is. I'm like, what's, what's kind of not expected about this character? And then I will get into that trait. Um, and sometimes it gets you into trouble because it makes things, it can make things unbelievable. Um, if you get too if everybody is too quirky or, or unexpected, then it then you you lose a little distance from them. Um, but I do tend to push back against the familiar. Um, yeah, I write in about places in New England. I'm like, I don't know anything about New England, <laughs> <laughs> but that's where a lot of my books are set because I just I just I picture it somehow, and I just like that. Um, so I'm curious. So you so did you 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 went from political journalism, it sounds like, into sports journalism. What was that What was that change about? Yeah, so I covered politics and I covered a lot of um, just general news, um, a lot of tragedies, a lot of crime. Um, and then I just had the opportunity to cover the NBA lockout for Fox Sports Network. And I was like, because it's a news story, you right. know, um, and it was right after Flight 800. No, no, it was right after Monica Lewinsky getting my timetable. But I had covered like a lot of sadness. Yeah. And so I was like, sure. And um, it wasn't fun for the players. It wasn't fun for the NBA, but it was really fun for me. Like I enjoyed covering the NBA lockout and the stakes just didn't feel the same as covering Flight 800, you know? Right. Right. And, you are ground down to a nub every day in, in yeah. misery and in grief. Well, yes. I mean, my mom used to say, like, my days were literally someone dies every day or, or multiple people. And it really took a toll emotionally on me. Sure. And I didn't realize it. And also, you feel guilty because you're just observing it. But the people you're covering are going through it. So, like, who am I? to be upset by it, right? right? right. Um, so then it worked out well with the NBA lockout and um, they asked me to stay on and I got to cover games and, you know, it's like you win, you lose. It, it was so- Were you a basketball viewer before that? Or did you have to learn the game? So I was a Knicks fan. I was a Giants fan because I covered all sports. Oh, okay. Um, not, 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 I was not an X's and O's person. I have a, I had a I had a strong learning curve. Yeah. There, but I wasn't doing play by play. I was doing more the emotional, the pregame, the yeah. post game in the locker rooms. I spent a lot of times in locker rooms, 
And, um, you know, it was, it was, it was fun to talk about the greatness it takes to win a game and then kind of how people handle the loss. I was very surprised at the large majority of good sports there, sportsmanship I saw, you know, more people, good sports than not good sports, although there were definitely people who weren't. Uh, yeah. Yeah, when you get to a professional level, I assume there's a mentality that's almost ground into you a little bit. As much as you hear about like winning is everything, um, understanding grace through loss is is probably something that's part of the job, you know, that that maybe, you know, lesser players never kind of get to that level. And to your point, I'm sure there are plenty of professional players who can't handle losing and throw shit against the wall and, and, yeah. and yell at reporters and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, it was, I remember, um, Al Leiter for the Mets, um, he was in the world series against the Yankees and it was the, I believe it was game four and, um, he just had a terrible game and they lost. And I went the next day cause he was literally cleaning out his locker, like at the locker, cleaning it out. And he just took the blame, you know, he's, he, I had to go interview him and he's like, it was my fault. I had a bad game. Yeah. And it was kind of incredible to like, to be so confident in yourself in general, to be able to admit you had a bad game. Right. And not necessarily put the sport as the pinnacle of all humanity of like, Hey, I'm getting paid to play a game. You know, I'm doing my best, but you know, if we lose, you know, the world still spins. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So, and and I'm curious when I talk to writers, you know, there's always their path to that first book is always interesting to me, right? Because some people have always just like, I knew I wanted to write a book since I was seven. I didn't know what it was going to be. Other people are like, I didn't even really think about being a writer, but all of a sudden, I'm like, Jesus, I have a great idea for a story because of my profession or whatever, um, you know, it's, it would be easy to label you as the latter, but, but you were saying that, you know, you would see evidence where you wanted to write when you were a little kid. Did your evolution as a writer become evident to you? Like, were you, were you having kind of weird, <laughs> weird thoughts? Like, you know, so, cause I started, I started writing one day out of the blue and I'd never thought about writing before and it just happened. It was a weird event. Um, so I'm always curious to know, like, is this something like, as you're doing the sports journalism, are you thinking like, God, this would make an interesting story. And I do like to write. I did take notes of things like at airports. I like try to notice little things here and there. And I have no idea where those notes were. So I think in the back of my mind, I was like looking at settings a little bit, mm -hmm. but where I really became conscious of it and I have no airports in any of my books yet. <laughs> <laughs> right. But you're you're forcing yourself to be observant. I'm being observed. Right. And then um, I stopped reporting when my kids were born. And I just, I've been traveling. Like, literally, I'd go to spring training for a month or I'd go follow March Madness for a month. I was away okay. a yeah. lot. And it was great, but it wasn't how I wanted to do the second phase of my life. And... Um, you know, I did like the mom thing for about three or four years, the volunteering at all the stuff. And then I just, my heart, like I miss writing. Mm -hmm. And I went and took a class at Sarah Lawrence Writing Center. Mm -hmm. And it's so funny because we're like sitting around the table and, and they're like, well, who do you want to be like? And everyone's like, Margaret Atwood, Joyce Carol Oates. And I'm like, John Grisham. Right. <laughs> so... I just really dove in about 12 years ago into this and rewrote the same story in a sense, the protagonist being a sports reporter living in Greenwich, Connecticut, which is one town over from me, but way more interesting, the teenage kids, all the basics. Now, the story changed so much over the years. It also took me a really long time to get an agent. I started at Pitch Fest, which, you know, at Thriller Fest, mm -hmm. uh, you do the speed dating to find an agent. And that was, that was eight years ago. I tried it mm -hmm. and I made some progress, but it ultimately 
got rejected. And then I sent out a hundred, because I counted it recently, 168 queries. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it didn't hit. And I was at the point last summer, like a summer 18 months ago. So um, where I was literally going online and looking up on Mystery Writers of America, the publishers that take non agented submissions. Mm -hmm. And my friend who you know, Tessa Weggard, who worked oh, yeah, she's great. She's the best, right? She had read my manuscript and she's like, Elise, you have to try a little longer. And she made me go to Pitch Fest again in 22. And and she she was running, co-running Pitch Fest, but right. like, <laughs> we'll just throw that out. But but like it wasn't like a suggestion, like she literally um nagged me and in a good way, nat yeah. like I owe her everything to go. And I got my agent and I got my um publisher a month later. So yeah. you know, if it wasn't for Tessa, <laughs> right. I wouldn't well, be here talking to you. And that's a great that's a great story, right? Because, you know, couple of things to unpack from that. First of all, you finished the book and you decided to educate yourself about the industry, which honestly, not a lot of people do. And then by educating, I mean, like you're going to conferences, you're understanding who the players are, you're making connections, you're networking. Um, and I did all that stuff too, before I was published mm -hmm. because it's interesting and it's, it's necessary, um, yeah. to be a part of that community. If you want to be a bigger part of that, that community, right. um, but also the lesson of patience, right? I mean, how many times have we talked to people who just give up and yeah. or they self-publish, which is, again, there's nothing wrong with that. But, you know, if you're getting rejected, you need to be curious about that rejection and, and, and not just say, you know, nobody likes me or they don't know what they're talking about. And because maybe you were maybe your query itself wasn't what was right. Um, you never know. And, but the reality of it is it takes a long time. I was, yeah, I was 70. I mean, I, I, during the snail mail days is when I was querying. So I was thinking about, is this a nice looking paper? Is it thick enough? Will they like this? Okay. And it was 75 rejections before I got my agent and my first book, my first three books didn't sell. In fact, my first book was titled finding the lease, believe it or not. Uh, <laughs> Elise was the name of a woman in a painting. Um, but it's just, it takes time. So you have to have the passion there to be excited about what you're doing and the research and, and the query letters is all, you do it, but then you let it go and just keep writing, you know? Um, and and yeah, God bless does it. But you would have come to that point anyway. You would have I, I suspect you would have realized like, you know, okay, I, maybe I need a break from this, but let me go back into it um, because it's brutal. I mean, so many yeah. people don't ever get agents and so many people get agents and never sell a book. I mean, it's just the yeah. reality of publishing. So, but it seems like you got you, you did quite the success story the second time around for sure. Um, and then, and then you said within a month they sold the book. Yeah. I mean, once it happened, it was crazy. Um, Thomas and Mercer was the first place my agent went. And yeah, it just happened really fast. And um, I got, it's like it took so long and then it happened so quick. I mean, yeah. I got, I feel so lucky at the end of the process. But yeah, it took a really, really long time. And this is, this is a broad, broad generalization. But I'm all, I'm curious because of all the feedback I get from my editor and hearing about trends in the industry. You know, I'm one of the, not a lot of guys are writing in the domestic suspense, domestic thriller right. space. And I just happen to to like that space. I would, I would guess that there's not a lot of uh, crossover of domestic suspense and thrillers and sports. Um, and, yeah. I, and I'm thinking that's got to be pretty intriguing to a publisher. Um, and, and again, that's a gross gener generalization, but I, I'm guessing that was pretty an interesting angle. I think that I, again, hit it at the right time because mm -hmm. some of my rejections later on, so let's just say three years ago, um, the the first lot of rejections were were editorial. You know, I needed, like, I didn't have enough suspense because I wrote like a reporter and told you everything. You know, genuinely things wrong with my men. These are, these are agent rejections you're talking about? Yeah, 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 yeah. agent rejections at the beginning. 
Um, and when I was lucky enough to get feedback, you know, I really tried to learn from it. Um, but then at the end, there was a, oh, sports will never sell with a domestic suspense thriller type of, of um, uh, topic. Hmm. And then um, Allie Reynolds published Shiver, mm -hmm. which, you know, did phenomenal. Leanne Moriarty um, published Apples Never Fall. And all of a sudden there were little cracks and I had real comps. And it turns out also my editor, Liz Pearsons, is a huge sports fan. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> yeah. And there there was all of a sudden, I don't, like if I had taken this book to Liz or I, I had an agent, you know, years earlier, she might have been like, yes, let's go. But I never was able to break through the agent to the agent um, with the sports element. Yeah. And, and my book isn't an X's and O's book. It's more like the sports is the setting and it's right. more woman in a man's world kind of a thing. Right, right. But you still, what's so interesting to me is like, you know, there's so much thought put behind the back cover copy where you could lose somebody, seriously, just with the word sports, if if that's not what your audience is typically used to read, even if it's just a gentle background to your story. Um, yeah. So they, you know, there's that process as well. Um, I mean, I, I, I think it's, I think it's fascinating then the name of my so my publisher usually changes the, the, my titles and the name of my upcoming book is the father she went to find and I wasn't crazy about that title it uh -huh. felt a little clumsy to me but you know my editor's like father isn't used a lot in domestic suspense girl and woman and there's not a lot of uh -huh. oh that's interesting so there's just I am always fascinated by you know just those small little decisions that are looking for those those little openings. Um, that you just never know quite where they're going to come from. Um, yeah, yeah. And, and I'm also curious about that you're writing this as a series, which as a business decision is is something to talk about because with a debut author or somebody considering a debut author, a lot of times they wouldn't want to commit to to anything more than the one because we have no idea how this is going to sell. Right. Um, and and it doesn't sound like you did. You, I mean, it doesn't sound like you came to them with books two and three and four already written, right? No, I had. Um, they asked me if I if it could be a series. What I thought about. Oh, they series. asked you if it could be. Oh, that's so interesting. Yeah. And I was like, yes. <laughs> right. And I did have ideas of other sports that I wanted to do, and um, the second one actually is um at the olympics in new york city and um mm -hmm. hate is spring soccer so it takes you back into her background like a lot of things from her life weave together in it um i was excited about it i had originally thought of it as a series and then my agent sort of felt how you felt like you know let's see let's do it initially so it could go either way yeah. and um yeah, they they were excited about the idea of a series. Yeah, and another publisher might have said no to a series. I mean, it's it's yeah, you, you never was... know who it's going to land with. And having yeah. your editor being uh, themselves engrossed in sports obviously is <laughs> is yeah. helpful. But yeah. but it makes sense, right, to have a sports reporter character because there's it feels like there's an endless amount of possibilities. Uh, much like, you know, a detective solving murders. There's always going to be exactly. murder. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. It's, um, it's interesting because you were talking about titles. So that was a big deal. Um, I had some title without secrets and her and nothing with sports. And I, I basically just we, we came up with a list of ideas because because it was a very I really didn't have any sense of how to they would want to market it. I mean, they were obviously the experts. So we were kind of looking for a title that if you know, you know, it's a sports term, but if you don't, it can stand alone as a domestic thriller. Mm -hmm. So, you know, lights out is a basketball term, but if you don't know that, right. it's the worst. Right, right. You know, it could just mean death. <laughs> right, like lights out. And, and we're not showing there's a basketball on the cover that's like this big, but you're seeing a house with lights in the dark. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's the it's so thoughtful about all of that. 
what is it, you know, not that we all have, as we're going through this process for the first time, not that we have a whole lot of understanding or expectations, but has there been anything about the publication process so far that has really surprised you and been different than what maybe you had expected? Um, not, well, the horror st stories I've heard, I haven't experienced. I mean, I feel very lucky. I keep repeating myself, but I'm very happy where I am and my experience with this book and with my uh, editor has just been phenomenal. The developmental editors at uh, Thomas and Mercer, you know, I've heard are very good and, and that's been my experience. And like Liz Pearson's has been amazing. Um, I also would say that, you know, Tessa held my hand, Tessa Weigert, where mm -hmm. we're talking about her through the process. So there's a lot of things that I think even just uh, getting um, events at bookstores or how to post something. I mean, very basic things. Do I repost this? Do I do that? Like that could be so many landmines. Mm -hmm. uh, Tessa has walked me through everything. So I think that that made a huge difference. And I guess I would say to any debut author, you know, find a Tessa. <laughs> yeah. Find somebody who's ahead of you who who will walk you through all the little things because there are so many little things. Totally. And and that kind of goes back to our conversation about community and networking. And, you know, it's so easy to envision, you know, for the layperson, a writer being very assault very much a solitary animal. And and they certainly can be, but it 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 just behooves you to find that community. And to this day, I will have, I'll reach out to a friend of mine who's a writer and be like, hey, can we just talk for a half an hour? Because, you know, just talk about our careers. I'm just curious to know how yours is going and and what things you did that, that you know, might be interesting for me to, to, to take as advice. Um, it never ends, just like any other industry, right? Yeah, yeah. It's, well, okay, yes and no. I did not feel the camaraderie that we're talking about in the reporting industry. Uh, I felt much more competition. Yeah. Uh, and there's a pie, you know, there's a 30 minute pie, there's news in there, there's weather in there, and you're fighting for little slivers. And so, so I didn't feel, I had certain friends, I had people who were helpful. Sports was nicer than news for sure. Um, but no, I didn't feel that. But yeah. but now I do. And like you were saying earlier, um, the Northeast is full of report of um writers and there's such a community. Like, yeah. you know, Wendy Walker has been so nice and Lynn Constantine and Tessa and it's yeah. just phenomenal. But yeah. But it's you to me. Yeah, and it's you right. So you don't trust them at first, you're like, what do they want? <laughs> <laughs> but you find that they're such gentle people. You know, yeah. the, the the mystery thriller suspense community are the nicest people and they will go out of your way to promote your book, to blurb your book. They don't look at it as like, well, they buy her book. They're not going to buy my book because that's all bullshit anyway. Though, you know, I, I just a very my experience has been a very selfless community. And then that that prods you to to give back as well. So if somebody asks you for a blurb, you're like, of course. Like I, I remember how grateful I was when somebody gave me a blurb for my first book. Of course I'm going to give them a blurb. Um, you know, so it's it, it it just is kind of the cycle. And then you see it all manifest itself at like thriller fest. We're like, yeah. man, these are just cool people. <laughs> They're just fun yeah. people to hang out with. Very down to earth. Very down to earth. It's so nice because I'm enjoying the social element of it, where I always felt very on guard when I had to do something as a reporter. It felt right. like, right. and my good friends were my college friends or my high school friends. They weren't my colleagues. And it's so nice now to consider my colleagues, my good friends too. Right. And it's just like, you know, I don't go home. Well, you don't usually leave your house, so you're not home <laughs> <laughs> and thinking like, oh my God. Did I say what I do, you know? Right, right. You're not second guessing yourself. Yep, exactly. Just much nicer. Yeah. Well, Lise, we're going to wrap up. Before we do, we're going to do real quick storytelling and we're going to uh, hold your feet to the fire on the, oh, no. making, on the making it up 
portion of the show. Okay. Um, I've chosen three books, uh, more or less at random, off my bookshelves. They're all signed editions. That's the only thing that they have in common. Okay. Um, you're going to choose one of those books, and then we're going to pick a random sentence from a random page. I'm going to read that sentence, and that'll be the first sentence and maybe a two-minute long short story. Uh, so I'll read the sentence. You give me the next two or three sentences that happens. I'll do a couple, and then I'll, I'll put it to bed uh, <laughs> at some point. Um, okay. So I've got Harlan Coben's Six Years, uh, Gillian Flynn's Gone Girl, and this is actually somebody who just reached out to me and said, hey, can I send you my book? I'm like, sure. So I haven't read it yet, um, but I'm sure it's great. Uh, Temperatures by Suzanne Crane Miller. Um, so choose one of those. Well, I knew when you held up the first one, I was going to pick Harlan Coben because his Myron Bolitar series, you know, kind of started the whole sports thriller Genre. Mm. Oh, interesting. Oh. Okay. Okay. So, so we're all right. Give me a page between one and 350. I have to tell you, I'm a little nervous. <laughs> yes, me too. <laughs> okay. Uh, 143. Okay. I'm going to look and find a sentence that I think might suffice. It's the very beginning um, of a chapter. Uh, okay. This is a very basic sentence. You can do, you can go wherever you want with this. Okay. And I can go first, too, if you want to. Just let me know. I knocked on the door of a home located on a quiet cul-de-sac. Wait, you just went out. Oh. You went out. <laughs> hang on. Is that better? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. <laughs> hang on. I lost the page. <laughs> um, I knocked on the, on the door of a home located on a quiet cul-de-sac. The woman who opened the door looked like someone I used to know. I couldn't believe it. She wore a look of suspicion, as I would too. She didn't know why I was here. I wish I had happier news to tell her. But even though I had only seen her in pictures, I asked if I could come in and told her I had to explain something and this would be hard for her to hear. She asked me who I was and I can understand her not wanting me to come in until I identified myself. And it was then that I realized and remembered that I wasn't in uniform. So I opened up my purse and pulled out my badge and made a formal introduction. And that is when the color of her face went from a light pink to a stone gray. She led me inside and we went and sat down on the couch. Um, she leaned forward while I sat next to her and I told her I have some terrible news and pulled out a box from my bag. And when I thought about it, I was wondering if the news actually might not be so terrible for her. I have no idea what her relationship with her husband was like these days. So I said to her, your husband, Arnold, has been found. She gave nothing away by her expression, so I couldn't tell if she was happy or sad. Um, I said... He was found dead after being pulled out of the lake. And this, if they, this box has his wedding ring that was given to me to give to you. I've seen a thousand different emotions on the faces of everyone that I've told horrible things to. And her expression fell somewhere in the category of disbelief. Although I've also seen it practice so well to be deceiving. And it was then that I noticed out of the corner of my eye a small bit of mud on her carpet leading into the garage. You don't seem that surprised. I said, 
um, reading underneath the vibes that she was giving off. She said, he's been gone for weeks and it's not like him to get back to me. She looked to where my eyes were looking on the carpet and said, it's not what you think. And maybe that was true. There are many reasons why anything any of us think can truly be unearthed and then discarded. And truthfully, the mud didn't even stick with me that much. But what did stick with me was the fact that she wouldn't touch the wedding ring. We'll just call it there. <laughs> yeah, that's a good ending. <laughs> yeah, I, that, that is potential. That, that is could potential. be third, third in your series. There you go. There uh, you go. So the woman is a, a sports star. <laughs> ah, exactly. We forgot to mention that. Yeah, if they find out she's a killer, it's going to destroy the world of sports. Exactly. Exactly. Thanks. <laughs> Perfect. Well, listen, at least not only was it a pleasure meeting you, but I'm so excited for uh for your upcoming launch and i feel like i've made a new friend in the community and and i maybe you'll be at thriller fest next year i am actually booking yes. booking the registration today since uh since prices <laughs> go up at the end of this month so um, i know i know yes definitely a new friend i'm so excited and i will see you at thriller fest awesome sure. enjoy your week so great talking to you you too bye Take care. Care. bye so that's it that is my uh conversation with elise her kipness uh Vastly entertaining, fantastic person. I have a feeling we're going to be able to connect while we're in uh, Thriller Fest next year. Um, love to be able to meet her in person, but I really enjoyed that conversation. And uh, I think we did a pretty good job with that story. I think um, there was definitely a good mystery uh, aura about the little tale that we conceived. Please go order her book, Lights Out. Please go find out everything you want to know about her at her website at eliseheartkittness.com. And then head on over to my website, carterwilson.com, and you can um, buy my books, uh, check out my appearances. And, um, and, if, and like I said in the opening, if you're interested in one-on-one -on -one mentoring, one-on-one -on -one coaching, um, that is something that I offer. Um, and there's a link on my website for just that. That is it for now. Thank you so much for listening and watching this episode of Making It Up. More episodes coming out soon, next week, in fact. And in the meantime, take care.